Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final session of Asia Tech, which is a panel discussion. And the topic that we're going to discuss today is uh, taking Singapore forward in technology, innovation, and enterprise. Now, as we all know, Industry 4.0 was really upon us uh, for about the last decade or so at the turn of the century. And uh, we had seen disruption in many industries, business models, disruption in jobs. And technology, both revolutionary and evolutionary, created new opportunities, but also created many problems uh, for many companies, for industries, for individuals who were not fast enough to change. Now, when the COVID-19 hit us in 2020, the disruption that we were already seeing took an even steeper trajectory, you know, completely disrupting global supply chains. And when this happened, uh, there were new challenges and, of course, new opportunities that arose. Now, digitization is one of the key areas that the Singapore government identified a few years ago uh, as part of the report that was uh, uh, released by the Committee for Future Economy about uh, uh, an approach that uh, we can take to revitalize and to uh, transform company to participate in the changing world that's coming, coming ahead. And, uh, and, and this is one way to redefine business model, redefine skills, and this needed all of us to be prepared in this environment. So COVID kind of accelerated everything and something that we thought could not happen, happened for many industries. Uh, they transformed uh, very rapidly. Now in Singapore, uh, we, the government has been uh, every five years releasing um, our uh, research, innovation and enterprise plan uh, that talks about research activities, innovation and enterprise activities. And uh, we have just released a 25 billion plan early this year uh, to look at research and innovation. And so we do recognize that Research is something that is basic and we have done a very good job at, but one of the challenges that we have faced in Singapore is our ability to commercialize, to transform the research into businesses. And uh, these are things that we want to discuss today. So joining us today, uh, we have uh, our very distinguished panelists. Uh, first of all, Professor Tan Sobi, Assistant CEO of ASTAR. Mr. Edwin Chow, Assistant CEO of Enterprise Singapore and Mr. Dominic Ang, CEO of the Action Community for Entrepreneurship. Now, our panel members have been very active contributors to the innovation and enterprise ecosystem in Singapore. And I would like to ask each of our members to briefly introduce themselves and also answer this first question that I have for them. Now, what do you see as the greatest challenge startups and spin-offs face today before, both before the COVID uh, pandemic and as well as after, that means moving forward. Uh, can we start off uh, uh, by, uh, maybe Evan, can you start off by uh, answering this question? Introduce yourself first, and then, uh, you know, uh, answer this question. Well, sure. Thanks very much, uh, Indijit. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Edwin Chow. I'm the Assistant CEO of Enterprise Singapore, uh, overseeing our efforts in uh, innovation and enterprise. Um, a quick word about Enterprise Singapore. We are a government agency uh, in, under the Ministry of Trade and Industry, and our mandate is to help Singapore companies, especially our SMEs and startups, uh, help them to grow in Singapore to be more productive, uh, help them to internationalize so that they're able to capture a slice of uh, the growing uh, demand uh, outside of Singapore, and finally to help them to innovate, to be competitive, to compete on knowledge, uh, IP, rather than on cost. So my group uh, and I, we've been involved in this whole uh, technology innovation and enterprise space for several years now. Uh, and we pay particular attention to our startups, our innovative startups, right? Uh, companies, uh, I'm sure many of you are in the audience uh, who are able to go from zero to hopefully unicorn in a short space of time. And um, Indigit, your question about the uh, challenges faced by these uh, startups before and after the pandemic, uh, frankly, I think that in my opinion, the challenges are the same. It's just that uh, COVID has uh, accentuated some of them. Um, first and foremost, all startups uh, require uh, at the most basic level money. Right? Uh, so uh, investments from uh, third party investors, angels or institutionals, uh, they require access to markets. Uh, and finally, they require uh, uh, talent to help them to grow. So before the pandemic, I would say the one biggest challenge they faced was uh, probably 
um, uh, access to market and the ability to achieve product market fit quickly so that they can uh, hit the road running, uh, get revenue in, and then uh, start the raising uh, more funding to help them to grow. Um, COVID has, has uh, made this worse, uh, partly because if you are, um, especially if you are a B2B deep tech startup, uh, you need your customers, mainly companies, to evaluate your technology, evaluate your solution before making a decision to buy. Uh, Pre-COVID, you know, we were able to visit, travel, uh, meet people in person, conclude the business. But with COVID, um, things had to slow down inevitably. You, you can only do so much remotely. Uh, and I think uh, this has uh, affected a number of our uh, B2B startups. Uh, but I also want to add on a slightly positive note because um, while travel and uh, COVID disruptions has affected our startups, uh, there have been those, uh, especially in the digitalization space, right? Those that uh, serve the consumers uh, and you know carousels and uh, the e-commerce platforms, uh, they have actually uh, benefited significantly from this uh, increasing accelerated digitalization. Uh, and I'm sure uh, this is a topic that we can come back to later. Uh, thank you, Edmund. Uh, uh, next, can we hear from uh, Professor Tan Suvi? Oh, thank you, Indijit, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me and giving an opportunity for ASTAR to share what we are doing to help the ecosystem and research innovation and enterprise. ASTAR, <clears throat> similar to uh, Edwin's uh, Enterprise Singapore, is part of the Ministry of Trade and Industry. We are a national R&D organization. Uh, we provide uh, support to companies who are based in Singapore multinationals, large full enterprise, SMEs and startups in their art innovation journey and uh, the science and tech mm -hmm. by the various institutes in our Biomedical Research Council as well as the Science and Energy Research Council. And uh, we support the uh, research innovation at the uh, RIE 2025 by uh, not just as a performer, but also as the administrator for various ecosystem competitive grants. In the uh, RIE ecosystem itself, there are four domains that uh, we uh, support. These are primarily in the human health and human potential. Uh, this is really looking at health and biomedical as well as human potential challenges that Singapore face uh, as results of uh, also aging population. We also look at the manufacturing trade and connectivity as uh, manufacturing comprise about 20% of our GDP, but we are very much linked to the global supply chain through our air, land, and sea port, uh, hubs. We are also working very closely on the smart nation and digital economy because this is where we pivot in the digital economy. Uh, and lastly, uh, this is also something that affects a lot of economies in the world is about uh, sustainability and uh, solutions as well, and decarbonization. And in, in this uh, aspect itself, uh, I would say that um, there are various uh, uh, startups and spin offs that have, as what uh, Edwin alluded to, um, face some challenge uh, in the, during the COVID period is because they are in the BOT space. But likewise, we have seen that during COVID, uh, as a result of uh, over two decades investment in health and biomedical sciences, uh, Singapore has leveraged upon uh, these deep capabilities towards uh, getting ourselves uh, be able to. Uh, uh, overcome the COVID uh, challenges and also moving ahead. Uh, this is, for example, by the, uh, the working of the National Diagnostic Development Hub, whereby this is a national platform to help di in vitro diagnostics. And through that, we developed the 42 test kits. And this test kit is really one of our homegrown uh, PCR tests that allows us to be able to test very quickly, especially in the early days, about one and a half years ago, where there was really a big shortage of uh, test kits and reagents globally, and we are able to use it ourselves. The company that we licensed uh, this out, the spin-off called Mirexis, uh, performed, very, uh, uh, um, uh, performed very well, uh, not just in this, but also taking advantage of other biomarkers that uh, ASA has licensed them. And uh, we have seen that in the last uh, uh, 12 months, biomedical startups have actually uh, been very successful in Singapore in fundraising. And Mirexis itself just closed a 477 post money round with 77 million US raise. I think this is a very remarkable landmark for local biotech. We also have um, platforms by which we see that uh, startups are uh, venturing offshore. 
And ASTAR represents Singapore by setting up a partner center, for example, in China and Shuzhou. And through that, we helped our Singapore startups and biotechs, both biomedical as well as uh, physical sciences as AI startups going through land in Suzhou. And from there, we have a hub for them to venture across the rest of uh, uh, China. And one particular startup, uh, Xjera, was also very successful by going through Eastern Partner Center and getting new businesses in China as well. I, I think that uh, generally, it is not just the Eastar uh, spin-off have done well. Uh, we have also seen the very successful spin-off from the universities from NUS and NTU, especially in the COVID fight. Uh, both of them are in the news where they have developed novel technology looking at breath for testing. One helping in the uh, airport side and one is helping at land border. And this goes to show how we are leveraging about the deep uh, research we've done over the last two decades to make use of us as we overcome the pandemic. And uh, hopefully we can open up in the days ahead. Thank you. Uh, but uh, so we, as you know, it was quite impressive to see many of our medical-based companies pivoting and coming out very strongly and uh, you know, coming out with test kits and many other uh, products. Uh, that, that was uh, something uh, that's, that's, that's great to see. Uh, Dominic, can you, uh, you know, uh, share you, your members are startups and uh, what are the challenges that they face and are facing uh, post-COVID? Yes, certainly. Thanks, Indajit. Uh, and hello, everybody and audience all around the world. My name is Dominic. Uh, thanks for having me on this panel. I lead the Action Community for Entrepreneurship as a CEO. We are actually a trade association representing the voice of the startup community. So unlike my two previous uh, uh, distinguished panelists, I, I'm not from the government agencies and I represent the private sector. So prior, prior, back to the question, prior to this, uh, uh, a, a short introduction of myself. I had over 30 years of corporate experience and last 15 of which was in the C-suite. Though I'm not an entrepreneur myself, I have been involved in uh, corporate entrepreneurship. Uh, I started and grew greenfield business units within the larger corporate context. So th to the question, um, I think the perennial challenges which startups face, regardless whether it's pre or during COVID. Uh, one, I think Edwin has alluded to it, is the lack of a sizable domestic market. So what this means is that our startups really need to work extra hard to earn that first reference client, to gain that track record. And they really also need to have a global mindset from the word go or at least a regional mindset due to the fact that we have a very small domestic market. And I think the second uh, perennial challenge is, uh, you know, is a function of a global trend. There's a shortage of tech talents worldwide. Yeah, no doubt our universities and tertiary institutions are, are doing its best to play catch up to produce the talent which we need. Uh, in the meantime, our startups have to supplement this with some form of imported talent. Now with the pandemic, uh, the shortage of talent becomes even more acute and due to the border restrictions, which we have touched on already. And the second uh, new challenge is that we've seen uh, some slowdown in fundraising activities and risk capital investments. So these together are what our startups are really facing today. Thank you. Uh, so the domestic market is, uh, is a challenge and, uh, and this is something that I think uh, ESG and, and AS, uh, AS have been doing quite a lot to try to bridge that gap. Um, uh, Professor Tan, I'll come to you now uh, to talk about uh, commercialization specifically. Now, as I mentioned earlier that uh, we've spent a lot of money in research and I think we have done uh, really good research. And uh, it's good to see that some of the uh, companies that came out, out of this COVID uh, situation, uh, you know, uh, did uh, commercialize the, the research. Uh, but, you know, uh, based on, I think, the last 30 years of RIE investment, uh, we have put in about 30 or $35 million, uh, or even more, I think, you know, in, uh, uh, in the area of research and innovation. So we have done great in research, but in, in innovation, which means commercializing and creating enterprises, uh, you know, uh, we could do better. I think this, uh, most of us uh, agree, probably agree to this. 
which are the areas that you think we can focus on, you know, that can change this and, uh, you know, to focus to create more success in the area of commercialization? Yeah, and that's a very good question because um, I believe that uh, this is not a unique uh, problem that we face uh, in Singapore. This is similar challenges faced by most uh, uh, even developed economies when you're trying to create value out of academic research. I think if you look at uh, some of the more successful ones, it is also trying to uh, understand a few things. One, uh, the research that we do uh, really blue sky or is it use inspired uh, basic research? I think for the use inspired ones, which is linked to an industrial or healthcare social problem statement, I think that's usually what is uh, useful to guide the development of the research towards a, a specific uh, use case because then you have a potential user or buyer standing there once the product is developed. The second thing, I guess, um, and this is where we are working very closely with ESG and also ACE, is to really train our research community to be familiar with the challenges of entrepreneurship. I think uh, writing a scientific paper, running a lab, you know, training uh, uh, students and also working with postdoc is a very uh, strong set of skills in our academic environment. But trying to commercialize this, especially when you're running a new startup, uh, understanding business, even how to raise money. I think the part of venture building is something that we can do a lot better. Um, and also trying to bring in seasoned entrepreneurs to help in uh, acting as mentors to our researchers is also very useful. The third is also creating uh, incubation hubs. And in ASTAR, we have our own uh, hub, which is called ASTAR Central, where there's over 20 over, uh, startups there, half our ASTAR spin out, half our external spin out, where we provide a variety of support. This could be uh, web ventures, this could be uh, engineering ventures, uh, but at a very affordable cost, especially for startup, because you are still running very lean. We bring in um, entrepreneurs to uh, teach a one-on-one -on -one of business. We also help to bring the, the business community so that they can actually help the uh, academic uh, researchers start to think about what the business model is. I think the challenge a lot of time is that we don't think about the business model in the beginning. We only think about after the spin-out is created. And then they realize that they are going to do a lot more thing until they can get the first uh, PO to be able to justify the valuation. So I think that the, the, the lot that we have done now, I think not just in ASTA, but with the university and US as enterprise office, NTU as intuitive, all of us are working very closely. Well, all of us are also trying to create a lot more incubation hubs closer to the businesses. Uh, for example, uh, bringing the multinationals closer to us uh, the VCs go so so that uh, the the flow and the conversation can get richer so that at least uh, we all help everyone. It takes a village you know, to raise a startup, to be honest. So I think this is what we are doing together. In the universities, one of the problems is promotion and tenure uh, is done based on number of papers that you have published. So in NTU, I was on the board of Trusty of NTU for many years and we tried to change that. Uh, we could not change uh, you know, the attitudes uh, very quickly, but I think that, you know, uh, we should be looking at how you know creating companies also will help you in your promotion. So I think that will that will help uh, quite a lot. On the other point that you made about you know that uh, researchers should be thinking about about uh, commercialization a lot more earlier. Perhaps one of the uh, possible ways of doing this is that when funding for research uh, is done, uh, one of the components that the funding organization look at is whether have you looked at commercial commercialization potential before the funding is approved. If it's a, if the funding is approved first, they do the research, they may not start thinking about it until very late. And, and we know that there's a lot more work than to convert. So that's a very, very good point. Um, uh, Edwin, I, I come to you now. Uh, you know, of course, uh, ESG primary role is supporting S, uh, uh, SMEs, but also, you know, the, uh, main organization that's handling startups, uh, the startup community down here. One of the biggest challenges have been, especially for SMEs, the adoption of technology and, uh, and, and you know, on how uh, this can be used to compete around the region here. We are seeing some progress. Now, what can we do more, you think, from your perspective, uh, that, you know, for SMEs to take that step and what can uh, ESG and the government do 
uh, to actually encourage that and to see greater adoption of technology uh, to make them more hmm. competitive. Well, thanks, uh, Indijit. Yes, indeed, um, that is a uh, uh, the, the big uh, question that uh, keeps uh, my colleagues and I awake at night. Um, maybe if you don't mind, I, I, I share a few numbers to maybe illustrate the, 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 the scale of the challenge. Yeah? Um, as of today, there, there are about uh, maybe 220,000 uh, companies in Singapore that meet our uh, SME criteria. And these are uh, number one, revenue, an annual revenue of less than 100 million Singapore dollars or uh, a, a company that has fewer than 200 employees, right? And that um, obviously to qualify for Enterprise Singapore support, they should be at least 30% Singaporean owned. Now, if you think about this, this sort of numbers, uh, we as Enterprise Singapore, uh, we only have a thousand people in the organization. So there's very... It's only so much that we can do to try and influence everyone. Um, but I think we are also realistic enough to know that not all of these 220,000 uh, are uh, going to become uh, innovative uh, innovation leaders overnight. So we are starting from um, the, the companies that are already uh, either uh, developing new products on their own or having some uh, process uh, IP that they can then use to command a premium to compete globally. Um, many of these, about 3,600, are actually our tech startups, right? Tech and deep tech startups. These are uh, typically, you know, third-party investor-backed, venture-backed, uh, and, you know, the likes of uh, Meraxis, your pet snaps, your carousels. Many of them are, are born here. Um, they grew, they are scaled up here, and they're now successful regionally, even globally. Uh, then there are, of course, the startups from overseas that have chosen to scale up through Singapore. And we want to find a way to get more of them to come in here. And then thirdly, there are a number, uh, a small but increasing number of what we call the traditional small and medium enterprises uh, who are making the switch, maybe from being a trader uh, to being a uh, solutions provider, a systems integrator, or uh, going into a product ownership. And we believe that um, technology, research, uh, all of these are the underpinnings that support uh, the growth of uh, these companies. So what can uh, Enterprise Singapore do? Um, well, first and foremost, uh, we want to uh, take a very market-driven approach uh, to helping these companies uh, transit or this help, help these companies grow. I mentioned earlier in my introduction that a lot of what we do is around trying to get product market fit. Uh, if there is a problem that someone is prepared to pay to solve or an opportunity in the region uh, that people are prepared to pay to access, we want to make sure we try and organize it such that as many of our Singapore-based companies are, as possible are able to access this. And uh, one big uh, effort of ours to do that is uh, to take an open innovation approach. Uh, we are going quite big on that. Um, and open innovation, in essence, is uh, having a company or government agency uh, or an investor articulate what the uh, so-called challenge statement is, what the problem is that they're prepared to pay to solve, we then uh, crowdsource solutions and we target those uh, small and medium enterprises, startups that are already based here, encourage them to uh, come forward and think about how they can pivot to develop a product that can meet these needs, meet the, both the technical as well as the commercial price points uh, that uh, these uh, uh, challenge owners are prepared to put on the table. And we as Enterprise Singapore will provide some grant money to uh, help those that have been selected by the challenge owners uh, to speed up their time to uh, market. Uh, and the challenge owners themselves, apart from be providing just uh, you know, the opportunity, they would typically also be encouraged to mentor these uh, selected SMEs and startups, provide them test bidding opportunities. And if they can validate their technology or their product here in Singapore, they get a reference customer here, this will then stand them in good stead when they expand overseas. Uh, we've done quite a fair number of these challenges over the past two and a half, three years. Um, the, the, there are some notable successes. For example, there's a, a, a local company uh, called uh, Transforma Robotics. Uh, they are, as the name suggests, a robotic company. Um, they took part in an innovation challenge run by JTC, Jurong Town Corporation, a fellow government agency, biggest industrial landlord in Singapore. Uh, JTC had a problem in both uh, stripping paint and then painting them. And, you know, this is very manpower intensive. 
uh, Singaporean, you know, not that many uh, painters, skilled painters here. So Transformer developed the robot, uh, won the challenge. JTC helped them to tweak their, their technology. Uh, and um, they are able to then take this and export to uh, other countries uh, in the region. Uh, likewise, there are other challenges that have been run by uh, large companies in Singapore. Uh, uh, Shell, for example, uh, Singtel, and a few others. Uh, where uh, companies, SMEs, were able to find opportunities to validate their technology, their products, and then parlay that into uh, global market opportunities. Um, and uh, let me make a short plug here for our website, uh, openinnovationnetwork.sg. Uh, that is where uh, uh, users can find a listing of all the ongoing open innovation challenges that are currently happening today. Uh, some are also international. So when we first started this effort, it was mainly around government uh, agencies. We then extended it to include uh, Singapore-based uh, large and local large and uh, large local companies and multinationals, and we now uh, are co-organizing challenges in the region uh, with uh, ASEAN neighbors, and most recently with uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, where they uh, we organized with them a innovation challenge around uh, smart cities. Uh, so uh, do uh, take a look at it if if you can. And I think this is uh, one uh, strong focus of, of uh, Enterprise Singapore moving forward. Yeah, you know, I do wish that uh, Enterprise Singapore gets the same level of, of resources as what EDB gets. And I think if you can get that, maybe you can do a lot more. So I know you guys are trying uh, very hard and, uh, and, and it's a big, big cohort of, of, of SMEs. Now, you know, uh, one of the things that ESG has tried for many years, uh, is for the universities and the polytechnics to work with, uh, with SMEs, right? How, how successful has that been? Uh, you know, are they talking to each other? Uh, is, is the connection good enough for that to happen? Sorry, is that a question to me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, it, it's, uh, I think it is happening, but again, to be honest, there's not enough of it and we are planning to do more. Uh, with the polytechnics and the universities, we now have uh, uh, about nine of what we call centers of innovation. Right now, these are uh, technology centers housed within the polytechnics uh, and a couple of universities, ASTAR as well. Um, and they have been set up to basically help uh, SMEs in a specific sector uh, to upgrade, to make use of the equipment and the expertise that's within the institutions so that our SMEs, uh, for example, they don't have to invest in their own testing equipment. Right? They can piggyback on the equipment that's found within the poly. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, our approach has been to organize them by industry sectors. Uh, and so long as uh, there is a sector in which a number of SMEs require this sort of uh, technology support and adoption, uh, Enterprise Singapore will fund part of the operating cost of these centers. And then we encourage uh, the SMEs uh, in this sector to use them. We promote them through associations, through partners like ACE and the uh, industry associations. And over the years, we have seen increasing uh, use of uh, these centers. Uh, and just to give you an illustrative example, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, when we first piloted this center of innovation concept, uh, we picked the food manufacturing industry as a, as a test case. And uh, in one of our polytechnics, the Singapore Polytechnic, we supported the setup of this food innovation resource center. Uh, back then, the number of companies that made use of it, frankly, maybe 10, 20% of the total food manufacturers here. And the type of uh, technical support that they required was very, shall we say, uh, very simple. You know, stuff like packaging, uh, shelf life extension, and so on. But as the industry evolved and became more competitive, uh, in no so small part due to this sort of technology support, today, our Food Innovation Resource Center is uh, helping to commercialize, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cutting edge uh, technology in the food manufacturing business, and whether it's in um, functional food, right, to turn the, the everyday food that you eat into something that's good for your health, or to use a nano level type of uh, processing to retain the freshness of the food so that it tastes better even after it's been shipped, uh, you know, uh, as far, halfway around the world. So this has allowed our companies to expand their market globally and to be even more competitive, uh, Singapore's high cost notwithstanding. So we're trying to do more of these with our polytechnics. Uh, we think there's a lot of potential there. 
uh, and uh, we watch this space. There will be some other uh, plans um, uh, that we will put into effect uh, in the coming uh, months ahead. Thank, thanks, Evan. Thanks. Uh, Dominic, uh, you know, I was involved in ACE when ACE started uh, right in the beginning. Those days, we were trying to make a big change, right, because we were not very entrepreneurial in Singapore as a country. So we focus on things like financing, education, culture, government support. And I think, you know, the, the, these were all things that uh, worked out quite well after many years. Uh, now, what are the areas that ACE uh, should be focusing on in the, the years ahead? Now, and especially, you know, now with the realignment of supply chains that are happening all around us, uh, there are opportunities that are, are coming up, uh, especially in the region and, and, and beyond also. And, uh, you know, uh, how do you see ACE playing a role to, to, to do that? And also maybe to address, you know, how can ACE help in solving these problems, uh, problem of companies uh, assessing universities and A-star technology and adopting that uh, as, as soon as possible? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Indajit, for your pioneering contribution to ACE. And you're right to say that uh, the basics have been put in place. So, for example, we, we have a very successful uh, venture building program, which we call the Base Camp. And, uh, and the graduates from, from that program is being uh, uh, helped through workshops, masterclasses, and even mentoring programs along their journey. So to, to build on the mountaineering, uh, you know, uh, metaphor, so we are like the Sherpas, you know, walking alongside our explorer entrepreneurs in their journey towards their, their unicorn status. So, but moving ahead, I think uh, you're right. We have to focus on, on new areas. Uh, and I, I think these are the three thrusts uh, ACE is looking at. First is really broadening the base. Uh, why? Because we really need to fill the pipeline, um, you know, generating new blood, new ideas from which new unicorns will arise. And we do this by going upstream and side stream. So upstream meaning we go and engage our youth much earlier, even before they enter the tertiary institutions. So maybe at, at secondary school uh, stage, we try to impress upon these young minds that uh, entrepreneurship is really a worthwhile uh, you know, endeavor for them to undertake as a life choice. And side stream, we will, so we have the, the youth thing that looks, looks at engaging the youth. So for Sidestream, we're looking at uh, very soon to launch uh, a, a women's wing. So I think uh, there are studies uh, done by Startup Genome that uh, among all the ecosystems, the successful ones, uh, the average participation rate of women founders is about uh, 25%, one quarter for the successful ecosystems. Singapore right now today, we are standing at something like 14, 15% women founders. So I think there's some uh, headroom for us to grow in that area. So broadening the base. So the second trust is we will try to catalyze new growth themes aligned with the mega trends. So we, we looked at, uh, I mean, we talk about the green economy, so more and more VCs, uh, private equity, uh, the risk capital, they are looking at ESG considerations as a prerequisite for investing. So the green economy is something I think we should focus on. Um, as a new theme, then urbanization, because the, the world is moving to something like two thirds of the world's population is now living in cities. So we need to have solutions, you know, urban living and mobility solutions. So that again will create a lot of opportunities for startups. Then we talk about food yield because there's a global food shortage. So how agri, agri or agro technology can help in improving food, food yield, especially for us in Singapore, which is so reliant on imported food. Uh, then aging population, that is another global trend, you know, two thirds, two thirds or nearly 70% of the world population will be above 65 by the year 2050. That's uh, according to a UN report. So health technologies, health tech, uh, these solutions will, will come in very handy. And, and Internet of Things, when we're trying to move into smart cities, so IoT solutions that powers all these smart cities. So these are the new growth teams we will try to help uh, you know, percolate or catalyze the, the, the community towards. The third thrust is capacity building. 
So as a TAC or Trade and uh, Trade Association and Chamber of Commerce, uh, we, we want to focus on continuous competency training for our members to up the quality quotient. I think some of the feedback we get from our venture capitalists is that there's no shortage of ideas or startups in Singapore, actually. The quantity is actually there, but I think uh, maybe they lament that maybe the quality is not really up to mark. So we really want to help in, in terms of building up competency among our startups. And we want to develop a comprehensive range of toolkits, you know, to help our startups uh, kind of like plug and play uh, toolkits on uh, fundraising, toolkits on, uh, you know, on uh, IP, IP protection, things like that. So these are the three, uh, three trusts we see ourselves focusing in the, in the years ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, um, we, we heard about uh, Singapore being a small market from everyone and so how to tap the regional market. I think all three of you have, have mentioned that. And, uh, and I know that ESG also has uh, you know, uh, worked on initiatives to reach out to the market. One of the things that I was working, I was on, on the uh, board of uh, NTUT until recently. One of the things that we were trying to look at was to build these regional uh, linkages with innovation players around the region. And the idea was a two-way thing for our startups to go and tap the markets through the you know, innovation partners in those countries in this region. And the other part of the flow I was looking at was for uh, for startups in the region, uh, and, and we have great technology down here who actually could use some of the technologies that we are developing uh, you know, uh, lo locally uh, here. Uh, you know, uh, how do each one of you think you know, that we can um, uh, strengthen these regional uh, linkages, uh, uh, this two-way flow? And I think if we can do that successfully, that could create uh, you know, quite a vibrant region for us and also help many of our startups. Mm. Have you start with... Yes. Yeah, uh, thanks, Inajit. Maybe uh, let me let me just jump in because uh, that's exactly the uh, aligned with the thinking that um, uh, we at Enterprise Singapore, uh, EDB, ASTAR, and you know a few of the government agencies have. Uh, it's how to make Singapore as a little red dot plugged into all of these global uh, nodes, uh, innovation nodes uh, worldwide. Um, we we launched this program. Um, our DPM Hing launched this program a few years ago called the Global Innovation Alliance. Um, and it essentially uh, is meant to identify uh, nodes, cities across the world with a concentration of uh, innovation uh, talent, right, kind of universities and so on and so forth, and a good concentration of innovative companies, in particular our startups. And the idea then is to work through, as you've pointed out, the universities, right, to have uh, one pillar, uh, we, we, we loosely call it the Talent Academy, where we want to send entrepreneurial undergraduates uh, to uh, these uh, uh, partner cities uh, to spend a year there uh, studying part-time, uh, but uh, working full-time in uh, interning in an innovation company there, typically a startup. And the idea then is for them to get connected, to know who the movers and shakers are, so that at the end of the one year, when they come back to Singapore, uh, they bring these uh, networks and experience with them. And uh, after they graduate, uh, what we found from our numbers, uh, both in, uh, you know, with NUS, NTU, and, and SMU, a significant percentage of them actually end up starting companies. And they know how to navigate, to take advantage of all the good things that the Singapore government and the private uh, VCs here have set up uh, and really take advantage and grow. Uh, some of our, our unicorns today, or, or soon to be unicorns, uh, were actually founded by uh, people who've participated in these uh, Global Innovation Alliance uh, Talent Academy. The other pillar uh, is uh, really in the startup networks, right? the innovation networks. And this is where we, uh, as Enterprise Singapore, we identify uh, partner organizations in countries uh, like uh, China, US, India, uh, partners who have the networks uh, and are able to help our startups and SMEs really scale up quickly. And typically, these are companies that already have achieved some product market fit. They are then able to uh, uh, find the right people to pitch to, find the right customers in uh, cities, uh, and um, hopefully secure uh, a, a good contract or a good deal, or even to find the right talent there. Uh, we have already 15 of such uh, GIA nodes, GIA partners all around the world, primarily in Asia, uh, you know, cities like Jakarta, uh, Bangkok, Ho Chi Minh, Manila, uh, also further afield, uh, San Francisco, Bangalore, uh, London, uh, Paris, etc. 
uh, and we're hoping to double this in the next uh, three to five years. Uh, with this network in place, we believe that these uh, bridges, right, uh, they are not necessarily one way, but as you mentioned, they are also uh, conduits for talent and startups from those countries to come into Singapore, spend time here, use the resources that are here, create jobs uh, and value, then become successful. And that's our, our game plan over the next few years. Uh, Zabi, do you, do you see uh, a role in it for ASTAR in this regionalization effort? Yeah, in fact, uh, I would say that uh, because ASTAR works with a lot of uh, multinational corporate uh, mm. and our uh, network with them is actually very strong uh, through the history of our institutes. And uh, I think one good example I can say is that uh, through ARTC, that's the Advanced Remanufacturing Technology Center, that's a joint initiative between ASTAR and NTU. Um, it has, uh, uh, it's a very successful industrial consortium of over 80 companies. And within it, that you have your large queen bees. And uh, I think last year uh, and the year before, we have also used that queen bee to act as a um, uh, problem statement generator to which we launch uh, startup challenges. So just in February this year, um, there was a program uh, for this year's uh, startup challenge with IMDA. That's the Infocom's uh, Media Development Authority with Open Innovation Platform OIP and as well as our ESTAR Central. We called for uh, interested startups to participate in industrial IoT for advanced manufacturing as a topic. And we got a lot of startups coming out, you know, AI startups, IoT startups, automated startups. And uh, these are based on problem statement posed by the companies such as Halliburton, Canon Metal, Procter & Gamble, Shell. And from there, I think the startups pitch and they were shortlisted to three. What's very useful is that these three companies will then go through an accelerator program. And you know, if they get their proof of concept products up, they have a journey to work very closely with the MNC and could potentially be a, a trusted supplier. I think, and through the MNC, you have a channel access outside uh, into their network across the world. Uh. So this is also another way in which we are facilitating our startup community to get themselves closer to the end users because by uh, yourself, it's very hard to open the doors. You know, but if uh, uh, com uh, platforms that uh, the ecosystem provide through A Star, through EA Star, EDB, ESG, we can bring the uh, consortiums in. We are starting to see that uh, the local company and startups are having a better chance to become the receptacles of the technology and the service providers. Now. And thanks. Uh, Dominic, ACE actually has also been looking a lot at regionalization in the past. I, is that still the focus right now? Yes, I think uh, just like what Edwin mentioned about the GIA uh, network, we also have a series of MOUs with various uh, uh, lending cities around, around the world, but mostly concentrated in, in Asia and Southeast Asia. We have something like 25 MOUs with some of these uh, partners. And uh, what we do with them is that uh, we have these two programs. One is a, what we call the market access program, and the other one is the market immersion program. So market access is the outbound. So we're trying to, to get our startups when, when they are ready and wish to expand into the region, we can leverage on, on this network of ours to help them uh, land overseas, okay, to make it more easy and seamless for them to, to start off in those overseas uh, markets. Then the market immersion program is the other way around, where we try to attract uh, potential foreign startups who wish to use Singapore as a landing pad or launch pad into Southeast Asia. We can help them with certain programs and kickstart them, uh, you know, acclimatize them to our cultural nuances, etc., and, and all the rules and regulations, the business environment, etc. So this, these are the two two-way programs which we run: the market access for outbound and the market immersion for inbound. So that's what we've been doing here. Thank you. And, and going forward, we are actually trying to see how we can uh, work even closer with ESG to merge the two networks, the GIA networks and our our series of MOUs. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you. 
Uh, there's a question from the audience, uh, and I think maybe Edwin can answer this. Uh, you know, based on the discussion, there are many initiatives in our educa educational institute to promote innovation and entrepreneurship. Question is, are there programs encouraging mid-career professionals to explore entrepreneurship? If yes, if not, if no, why not? But I know there is so, uh, Edwin, you can uh, maybe just share your Yes, uh, thanks, Indijit. In fact, uh, thanks very much uh, for, for this question. Uh, it, it's indeed, uh, the short answer is yes, there are several of such programs. Uh, and in fact, uh, speaking personally, uh, I'm, I, I have, I'm a firm belief, uh, I'm a firm believer that a startup uh, can succeed better if it has not just, you know, very young uh, uh, skilled programmers, but they can really benefit from uh, uh, professionals, mid-careers, uh, who bring with them their own sets of experience and networks to help uh, the startup founders, the young ones grow. So, the, for example, um, even as far back as three or four years ago, I believe there were a couple of universities, um, SMU was one, uh, that uh, offered a graduate cert in, in technopreneurship, they call it. And this is where they targeted uh, mid-career professionals, particularly IT professionals, right, who wanted to uh, learn a bit more about entrepreneurship uh, and eventually to sort of intern or be attached to uh, startups coming up from uh, 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 the SMU. Right? And they deliberately matched the mid-careers with the, with the startups there. And recently, they expanded this also to... Uh, startups coming up from uh, the uh, smart uh, campus in Singapore, the Singapore, Singapore MIT Alliance over in, in Dover. So uh, this is one uh, example of the this sort of the, the curated mid-career programs that are running today. The other example is something that uh, we at Enterprise Singapore launched more recently with the help of our universities and private sector partners. Uh, we called it the uh, Startup SG Founder Venture Build uh, Programs or uh, Train Programs, where, again, the idea was to have um, uh, programs run by the universities or the private sector venture builders uh, targeted at uh, mid-careers or fresh graduates. We don't, uh, we don't discriminate, but we deliberately reach out to the mid-career PMETs to bring them onto these uh, dedicated uh, uh, entrepreneurship training programs for at least three months, uh, at the end of which they will be uh, given a chance to uh, pitch to a panel, uh, including investors, uh, government officials, industry executives, and those who are successful uh, will get a grant of up to $50,000. Uh, in exchange, they have to start the company and have at least uh, three employees uh, for them to get them off to a good start. So this was something which we devised and launched uh, in the in the depths of COVID last year, and partly as a means to uh, mop up what we what we feared would be unemployed uh, PMETs. Uh, and uh, so far, things have are going quite well. We've we've rolled it out initially to, with the five uh, universities in Singapore: uh, SMU, NUS, NTU, SUTD, and uh, SUSS. And we recently brought on board uh, three private sector venture builders, uh, people like uh, Antler. Uh, entrepreneurship first, and uh, one more whose name I forget, so please forgive me. 500 startups, thank you very much. My colleague reminded me. And uh, so far, uh, as I said, numbers are, are quite uh, positive. We have several hundreds of these uh, uh, PMETs who have uh, signed up, and um, we're starting to see a number of uh, companies form. In fact, one of them uh, was uh, recently raised uh, first institutional round. Uh, which if you think about it, they started in uh, uh, December in seven months to raise the first round, uh, not a bad outcome. And I would encourage uh, all of you in the audience who are uh, thinking of uh, entrepreneurship, if you are a PMET, um, no, no better time than now. Just uh, give it a shot. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in MTU, we, we also uh, did the program with you. And, uh, and we did see some startups that have come about and some very promising one. And I think this is a good program. Even if, let's say, uh, professionals don't intend to start companies immediately, the train, entrepreneurship training is going to be very useful in whatever you do in the future. And I always believe that entrepreneurship is a matter of mindset, not just about uh, starting uh, companies. Now, you know, uh, from the description each of our panelists gave, uh, you know, I think each organization has done a great job uh, in focusing in their areas, uh, their parts of the innovation ecosystem that they're mandated to do. And, and they have also gone beyond <clears throat> their areas that they are ma ma mandated to do. And each of the universities also have done much in developing their own uh, innovation ecosystem. And I can say that from my experience in NTU uh, through NTU team that, you know, uh, 
that we've looked at uh, from commercialization to, to regionalization like that I talked about uh, earlier on. And uh, so we are all doing these things. Uh, do you see an opportunity for greater integration and coordination of the different innovation ecosystem players uh, so that we can be more coordinated? So we all are doing uh, things. Uh, do you see any room for, uh, you know, for us to, uh, to better integrate this? Uh, maybe so we, uh, we, can, uh, we can start with you first. Oh, definitely. Because I think, for example, not just in the area of healthcare, uh, in the area of manufacturing or even sustainability, the underlying horizontal is digitalization. And in that regard, I think there's a lot of opportunity for our very uh, deep and broad uh, 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 academic community and the talent in AI, data science, and the spin-outs that is generated to uh, leverage for all the rich um, uh, mm. data sets and problem statements that we have. Uh, because uh, healthcare uh, definitely is a need of uh, uh, digital transformation as well. Likewise, we talk about supply chain and also when we talk about uh, sustainability, I think uh, and energy, there's also the need for digitalization look at the grid. So I, I would say that there's a, a lot more uh, at the ecosystem level, uh, at the various ministries, we're trying to um, persuade uh, multidisciplinary collaboration at the, at the startup level, such that it is not just one startup, a uh, mixture of startups coming together, a uh, mixture of a public-private partnership, you know, different companies converging because the pie is big enough for more than one player to integrate. Uh, I think the, the important thing is really about uh, the attitude of the entrepreneurs, you know, and to be understanding that uh, in life, um, there's no straight line and you will have to constantly learn to pivot, you know, and to be open to opportunity to uh, uh, be guided, you know, especially by uh, us here uh, uh, at, the, at the public sector side to give you opportunity. But of course, at the end of the day, you will also have to make your own commercial decision. You need to also be able to take your business risk because in the end, as your investors who is going to back you and get their returns back. So it's a full circle. And uh, all of us are really very keen to see homegrown success. For example, uh, like Nanofilm from NTU, it took uh, Mr. Dr. Shi 21 years, but he's really done uh, a single Singapore proud. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't need the 21 years. We've seen what happened with Anthony Tan in, in Grab. We have seen, the, you know, uh, uh, Forest Lee with uh, SEA, we've seen also Lee Han with Razor. These are uh, the new generation of uh, startup entrepreneurs who are making it big as a multi-billion unicorn. So I think we can do it. Yeah, great. In fact, you know, I think the momentum is there and we probably will see many more coming. Uh, Dominic, what about you? What do you think uh, about greater integration? It definitely, I think uh, for ACE, it is really in our interest and in our members' interest to collaborate as widely as, and as broadly as, as possible. So we are always continuing this collaboration with all our uh, public agency partners, whether it's ASTAR, EDB, ESG, uh, IMDA, so on and so forth. But maybe this is just one idea which I thought maybe uh, uh, which we can carry it forward, uh, even maybe the next step. Because there are a lot of TACs or their trade associations. So, and each of them have got pockets of innovation initiatives. So I'm talking about, you know, uh, TACs such as ASME, uh, SCCI, Singapore Manufacturing Federation, so on and so forth. So one idea is that ACE perhaps can work with these TACs and we can be the, the, the lead aggregator to form some sort of an innovation alliance and come together, uh, conduct joint events, sharing sessions, and exploit maybe even overseas market opportunities together. What, like what the proverbial saying, hunting in a pack kind of uh, idea. So this pulling of resources, networks, and experts together with other TNCs, I think will really benefit our startups and our corporate members. So that's one idea I think we, we can uh, put forward. Uh, but if you're Alluding, if your question is alluding to more like structural integration of all these uh, efforts, I think that that is above my pay grade. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I think, you know, we learned that it's uh, good to have uh, 
uh, peaks of excellence in different places, but how we can then work together, I think that's more useful than to try to put all in one body. In fact, one of the, I, I wrote a paper on, on future of innovation and I, I suggested that we separate innovation from research, create another agency that handles innovation, you know, uh, because putting all in one, you know, gets an organization to focus too much in what they are good at and, uh, you know, may not on the other. So, you know, so I had suggested we separate the two. So, uh, putting all in one sometimes is not a, not a great idea. Uh, Evan, your, what about you? No, I, I, I look at it, um, I, I fully agree. I think there's scope for greater integration. But frankly, that, that is more of a, a topic that's interesting only for policymakers and maybe taxpayers. Uh, so to make sure that all government agencies are integrated. I thought the, the, the implication, the impact, the outcome that we want to see, right? Um, we, it, should be, it, should, rather, it should be one where if I'm an entrepreneur, regardless of anywhere where I am, whether in Singapore or in the world, I want to be able to uh, get access to investors, uh, markets, uh, talent, and to set up a company in Singapore as, as, as easily and as quickly as I can. And I think that uh, type of uh, end outcome is uh, what we probably uh, want to work towards. Uh, and it would require not just government coordination, right, um, but also the support of the venture capitalists that are here, support of the private sector that's in Singapore. Because one, one I, I, I come back to the point about open innovation and, and product market fit, because I think that's the real value that Singapore can offer to all of our economic actors, whether you're a startup, you're a SME, you're a, a, a big company executive, really how do you use this microcosm of Asia or Southeast Asia to really develop a solution, a product that can uh, that meets that sweet spot and from Singapore to then scale up quickly to the rest of the world. Now, if we can organize ourselves, right? And that's basically the reason why, you know, folks like Zivi and myself are here. If we can help to organize ourselves so that it's easy for the, all these actors, uh, company executives, VCs and so on to do that, uh, then I think we'll be halfway there. Uh, and we are starting to make uh, sort of small inroads into this. Uh, we are trying our best to organize uh, events, uh, both offline and online for VCs to meet with startups. We have this thing called Deal Fridays, and we're hoping to see more other organizations do that. Uh, Open Innovation, I talked about. The Global Innovation Alliance is another. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, it uh, really depends, as Zivi said, uh, on the, each individual entrepreneur, both the entrepreneur that runs a startup and the entrepreneur in a, a, a private company, right, to really want to make that next step. And I think for those that are based in Singapore, the Singapore government stands ready to help you make that journey. Thank you, Evan. So we're coming almost to the end of our session. Uh, you know, I'll ask one last question for each of our panelists. Uh, and you know, uh, the question is, you know, of course, soon Singapore and many of the countries around the world will be preparing for the new post-COVID uh, normal. If there's one advice that you can give to an entrepreneur, a startup, a SME, a researcher or professor, on what they should be doing now to be prepared for the new normal uh, that's going to emerge soon, what would that be? And uh, at the same time, please make a closing statement at this stage. Uh, Dominic, you want to start first? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, well, my answer will be slightly more philosophical, I would think. Uh, uh, quoting Lord Tennyson, he said, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. So paraphrasing him, my advice to would-be or new founders, despite the, the challenges that's, you know, the dark clouds that's ahead of you is, it's better to have tried and failed than never have tried at all. So my closing statement is, Singapore has actually a lot to be proud of. Uh, we have built an excellent startup ecosystem thus far. We are now ranked 17th in the world out of 140 ecosystems, fourth in Asia. 11 unicorns and counting. So we need to keep our momentum going. So such is the spirit of enterprise to go where no one has gone before, to create and conquer, and in the process, more importantly, inspire a whole new generation to do likewise. So onward, Singapore Inc. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, so we, uh, uh, you please? Wow, well, I can't follow that with a uh, <laughs> from poetry. Uh, I would be a lot more down to earth to be quite uh, pragmatic. Uh. I would say that uh, the opportunity for um, uh, entrepreneurs is ever present. It's just up to your tenacity. You have seen that 
we have seen that even with the limitation of physical contact as a result of COVID, uh, there have been many new uh, areas where individuals have taken advantage of digital platforms to pivot. And I think this is really a tremendous platform for us to bypass our physicality in Singapore, to seek areas in which we can get businesses beyond our little shore of 750 square kilometers uh, into the region, uh, into the Asia Pacific and into the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, the, the world is the oyster and I think the government together with research institutes and the uh, investment community is always prepared to look for new ideas to back. And uh, I think Singapore is also a very uh, favorable place for high tech uh, entrepreneurship because we respect the rule of law and IP. So we can do all this together. Thank you. Thank you, um, Kevin. Um, maybe I'll just say two things. Um, one uh, address to the foreign guests in our, in our audience. Uh, I think um, Singapore remains uh, open for business, uh, COVID uh, notwithstanding. Uh, if you are an entrepreneur, an inventor, a creator, a real talent, uh, and you're interested to uh, use Singapore to grow your company and realize your dreams, I mean, we're wel we welcome you. Come here, uh, try your best, take advantage of the networks and the infrastructure that we have. And uh, I'm sure you, uh, it, will, it will help you succeed. To our Singaporean audience, uh, if you are an entrepreneur, would-be entrepreneur, regardless of how young or young at heart you are, uh, no better time than now. Just, just do it. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, uh, this, uh, I wrote a paper on the future of manufacturing in Singapore recently. And, uh, you know, one of the things I identified was that we have an opportunity now with the realignment of global supply chain change to get back a bit more into manufacturing, which we were, slow, were slowly declining. And I'm glad to hear that at that time, uh, the, the trade industry minister, Chan Chun Singh, gave a goal of increasing manufacturing as component of EDB by 50% in the next 10 years. So I think, you know, that's a good uh, goal. And one of the ideas that I put forward was uh, Singapore to become the uh, startup uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, prototyping factory of the world. So commercializing to prototype, then prototype to mass production. We can do, with technology today, mass production can be done in many places. And we saw recently with uh, COVID, you know, we actually started producing test kits and many other things down here. Uh, I think if we can bring back manufacturing as a capability down here, and I think many of our SMEs can get into this area, uh, we will have an opportunity to you know to build a strong future economy. With that, uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank our panelists. Uh, you know, I, I was... Uh, uh, very impressed. You are all top leaders in your area. Thank you so much for sharing your, your ideas. And I hope that uh, the community that's listening to us, uh, both Singapore and overseas, uh, have an idea of how we are repositioning ourselves to move forward uh, in the new era that's coming. And I think, uh, you know, there's no place better than Singapore for us to launch startups of this region. And Asia is going to be the place. And we welcome everyone, Singaporeans and our foreign entrepreneurs to use this platform to, to reach the markets. Thank you. Let's give our panelists a show of hand. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Indajit.